Hello and welcome to this tutorial on building a clock in Second Life. The clock you're going to build is the one you see in front of you and it does work. It keeps um, time according to SL time, uh, the hands move, all the scripting is in there and so on. So it's pretty basic but it does the job and the idea is that if we walk you through how to build this right from the ground up that you can take those techniques and build something cleverer and more sophisticated and looks nicer than this. Um, but we do everything, we do all the scripting, um, all the textures, um, so you really get some insights into how to achieve this. So hopefully you'll find it useful, and uh, let's uh, let's get started. We're going to start off by defining the texture that'll be used for the clock face. So for example, the dial, the numbers, and so on. Uh, you may or may not be surprised to see that we aren't in Second Life doing this. This is an external product which is running on Windows currently. Uh, this is Coral Paint Shop Pro Photo 11. Uh, and we're going to use this tool to create the texture and then we'll import it into Second Life so you can see how it's being used. Uh, now you may be thinking, well, you know, you're watching this video because you want to understand how to use Second Life, not how to use some external product. But the, the truth of the matter is that in, in order to create textures of this kind, you have to use an external tool. Second Life won't doesn't have the means to allow you to create these things, and I find it's useful, you know, to watch someone walk through how to do this. Even if it's a simple example of the type we're going to build here, it's still useful to see someone do it because you get an idea of of all the steps that are required to to build this clock. We could have used um, some other tools to do this. We could have used Adobe Photoshop, uh, which is a very powerful editing tool. We could have used the GIMP, which is a free open source product, and all of those do similar things to what you're going to see here. So if you have those products you ought to be able to follow along um, to a degree in that they all work in a in somewhat similar way and certainly produce very similar results. Okay with all that in mind let's uh, let's move on. The first thing we're going to do is create a new image so if we do file new we can then specify various parameters for it. I've got the width and the height is 512 pixels, which is a size that works quite well in Second Life for a texture size. 72 pixels per centimeter um, and 8 bits per channel RGB. These are all things that work well in Second Life. Um, so I'm going to just set those as the, as the parameters we use for this image with a white background. So I'll click OK. And, uh, and there it is. Now I'm going to drag this uh, border out a little bit so you can see the edges which makes it slightly easier to work with. Now a clock um, typically has a round dial so we're going to start by drawing a circle. So if I select my circle tool down here from the drop down it's actually called ellipse uh, and you can select a circle shape within the ellipse. Uh, some other things to look at before we draw it is the line style, which is just a, a solid line, the width, which is one pixel wide, and the foreground and background color. The foreground is black and the background is red. Uh, and we'll, we'll come back and change those in a second. Let's just show you what it looks like if we draw it with the parameters as they're set. So I draw the circle by starting at the bottom right hand corner and clicking and dragging with my mouse. and up goes the circle and it will now fill it with the uh, background color and put the foreground color in a single little line around the edge which you may or may not be able to see there that's just a line of black around the edge so uh, I don't like that much I don't think that looks much like a, a clock face yet so I'm going to uh, make some changes to it first thing I'm going to do is change the foreground if I click on the foreground color I then get the material properties box and I have three tabs to choose from either a simple color which is what we've got now a gradient and we have a, a list of those that we can choose from or a pattern and again we have a list of patterns that we can choose from so I'm going to choose a pattern in this case for the um, foreground color and I'm going to choose wood tile 01 now when I press OK you won't see a great deal of change because it is simply replaced that single pixel around it is simply replaced that single pixel around the the outer edge so it's difficult to see so if we increase that width to something more realistic like 50 you'll then see the uh, edge appear and our wooden texture appearing so it's now gone over the edge of the frame because um we've increased that width so let me just select it and uh change the size down a little bit to let it fit our page um, our image size a little bit better and that's okay and I can align it by hand or I can use these positioning buttons up here to position it dead in the center of the canvas 
Now I don't like the red background at this stage so I want to change that as well. So I click the background and this time let's choose a gradient um, to fill in the background. Uh, and again there are many you can choose from. Um, I'm going to choose landscape which is a very nice plain colour and you can see it fills the, the, the background in with the colour we've chosen. Now how about these white edges here? I think we could do something better than that. So let's uh, let's um, change that uh, and uh, in order to do that we'll use the flood fill tool which is, which is down here, flood fill um, and we need to select a, a foreground colour, which is the, what the flood fill will use. Um, and let's choose another pattern to go on here. How about a lovely leopard skin to make it uh, uh, a really classy clock? So if I uh, select that and then click on the image, I get a little warning. And the warning tells me that uh, I'm currently working with a vector layer. It needs to convert it to a raster layer. Let's not get distracted by this right now. Uh, the concept of layers and the concept of vector and raster. Um, I don't think it's relevant for us to dwell on that in great depth. For now, let's just say OK. If you need to do that, that's fine. It's certainly not going to affect uh, the way this works in Second Life. So I'm going to say OK and then just click to use our, um, our fill color. Now, um, you may notice, and I'm going to zoom this in a little bit so you can see it, on the edge of our, of our clock we've got this sort of little bit of white where the fill hasn't quite worked completely. And when you're working with the flood fill tool it's doing its best to figure out where the edges are that you, that you want to fill. Um, and it gives you the ability to tweak that. So I don't like that, I don't want that little white bit, it might show up when we're in Second Life. So I'm going to undo that fill and just change the tolerance value up to something bigger, 150 perhaps. And If I then uh, use the fill tool and I zoom in, you can see it's done a much better job and we haven't got that white outline. So just uh, you know, be aware that there are a number of um, uh, ways you can use these tools and these products and it's worth uh, playing around with them and just seeing how you can make it as, as uh, accurate and effective as possible. The next thing we need to do is get some numbers on our clock face. So, for example, the number 12 at the top, the number 6 at the bottom, and so on. So, let's start by selecting the little text tool down here. And we'll, we'll just click on our image and enter some text. So, I'm going to enter the number 12 and apply it. Now, there's a few issues here. First of all, it's very small, so let me drag it to be a bit bigger. And also, you wonder, it's difficult to see, you wonder, might wonder why, um, it's using the foreground and background colour that we have selected here, which is uh, not what we want at all. So I'm going to change both of those to be black, uh, which will make it far easier to see and much clearer. There we are. Uh, and we can now move this uh, into position. And in fact, we can use the uh, positioning buttons here to get it dead centre. Um, now, with the 12 it's quite easy because we can use those positioning buttons to center it up but what about the number 1? So I'm going to just copy that for now if I do edit copy I then do edit paste as a new vector selection uh, and change it to the number 1 in a second so I'll paste it in first and then right click it and choose edit text I can then change that to a 1. Now the one that probably goes there roughly, but it's you know it's nice to be accurate, and it's difficult when you're trying to align these things by by eye. You might not get it quite right, and it, it might not look particularly professional if it isn't lined up well. So we're going to run through just a little trick for um, how you can do this. There's there's a number of ways it can be done, but a fairly common way is to take an image that's similar to the one you're trying to draw, and use it as a template, uh, and uh, line your objects up, and then you can delete that image and uh, you'll have your objects lined up correctly. So let me show you what I mean. 